This is the world on water for April 12. Here are the highlights in the sport of sailing for the last seven days. The vision you're watching is the Bannisters Port Stephens Commodore Cup Open Day. 100 boats opened a three-day series on Monday, April 8, in light winds and a postcard autumn day. Andrew Buckland has a revolutionary design in a 50-foot all-foiling ocean racer, which he's hoping to get into the next Rolex Sydney Hobart race. Could it foil all the way? Could it beat the Maxis? These are questions we pose to him. The Dragons had their Grand Prix in Cannes. Gold medal winner 470's Matt Belcher had a bad day in the opposite Palma, Mallorca. The Congressional Cup was on at Long Beach. The final day of the Finns and the gold medal race. The 29th Congressional Cup, days one and two highlights. Yacht Club Costa Smeralda shows us their 2019 lineup. Now let's see the boats at Port Stephens by courtesy of Hover UAV. We can feel the flow underneath our feet. Fire shots through my chest as you watch me bleed. Every kick, drum, head is a symphony. Every brush of your curves is the air I breathe. You speak, I am listening. Sweat rolls, girl, you're glistening Slow mo, pull me into the light, the light There are people watching us Wishing they were obvious Instead of giving into the fright, the fright Down at the uh, 18 footers at Double Bay, uh, we're doing a series of interviews with major sailors in the, around the world. And uh, one of the top 18 foot sailors, which we've known for a lot of years, who used to sail on the top rating Channel 7 uh, boat, is Andrew Buckland. Andrew does the voiceovers and the commentary on the 18 footers now. But he's got a, uh, a new project, so we just thought, thought we'd have a we'd find out what he's been doing in the past, let him tell us what he's been doing and what his his background is, and then he can then uh, we'll talk about this new project. Well, um, Benito have uh, just starting their uh, Figaro three campaigns, yep. and there's a lot of the French. Yeah, you know, there's half a dozen boats now. Yes. Uh, Got a regatta thing, and there's 24 amokas in this week in this year's uh, fastnet race. Yeah. So uh, there it is. The future is already here. Yeah. Well, and truly. Yeah. But see, the amokas is an interesting case. You know, not allowed a rudder foil, so it doesn't. Whilst the foil does provide 100% of the displacement in lift, the boat still sits on the water, and I guess this proposal that we've got is with a small rudder foil so the boat doesn't sit on the water as such anymore. It's still, it doesn't have to foil high like a moth. It can foil quite low and be pretty safe and satisfactory. But there's a fair bit of residual drag in the Amoka model from just the hull interference, even though it's not displacing, you know, hardly anything at all, we'd say. You know, it might be displacing less than one-tenth of its, of, its, um, of its mass when it's roaring along. But a fair bit of... Um, 
induced drag from just the water, wetted surface drag on the hull. The, uh, the Ocean Race just announced that they're uh, practically full as far as the number of uh, mokers for the next 2021 race. Yeah. So that's the sort of interest in, the, in those things at the moment. Well, I mean, who would have thought that we could go, you know, 500 miles in a day without too much stress? Mm. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Yeah. So, and oh, the makers are complex for the kit, you know, the way it's configured so single-handed is, is, you know, really very complex. Yeah. Um, and take your hat off to them, you know, for A, getting them to work and, and you know, being able to be managed by one guy and be staying in one piece for you know, 60 days at 30 knots, sort of more or less. Well, they had a little bit of a problem this year, didn't they, with the, uh, the route to run? Yeah. They didn't quite actually stay together. No, and they, the timing's a bit wrong, isn't it? They, going out into a low pressure cell in the Bay of Biscay, <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> well, it's always, it's yeah. always like that in the Bay of Biscay, isn't it, for yeah, the, yeah. Uh, like for the Vondé? Yeah. And of course, Alex didn't help things either by running into quite a loop. Well, you know, that's the whole problem, isn't it? You've got to sleep sometimes. <laughs> and his well, alarm okay. didn't go. Okay, bad. So tell us about the, the Buck 004. Well, <clears throat> V4, 04. I mean, I've been working on it for a while with, you know, the group. Um, Freddie Barris, the design principal. Um, and, you know, the question I put to him initially was, Freddie, what's the cheapest boat we can build that will foil that could go Cat 1? And and uh, of course that got a good laugh from Fred and after a bit of humming and harring and a bit of toing and froing we started at uh, you know 46 feet and um, I guess after we went around the mulberry bush a few times he said <clears throat> maybe you should just make it a little bit longer it'd be a bit easier okay mm. so it's now a 50 footer but um, it's light you know it's below 5,000 kilos light ship so full IRC displacement with crew and fuel and water and craft and all that stuff, um, you know, around 6,000 kilos. So it's pretty light. Yeah, well, I'm sure. And, uh, How many crew? Just seven or eight, yeah. Seven or eight. Electric winches. Yeah. And, you know, fairly sales. I'm not getting out of the cockpit you know, too much. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. And, you know, it's, um, it's, it looks like you, you've shrunk Chiral to some degree, but if you crossed Chiral with a TP-52, you'd get our boat, you know, shrunken version. And, and the foils are, you know, a fairly serious bit of effort, obviously. The rudder foil lifts about between 10 and 15% of the displacement, so it's lifting, you know, something like 750 kilos and, and the rest on the primary foil. So that'll, the primary foil span outside of the, of the, of the chine, outside of the gunnel would be about um, three metres. So that, and the thing I discussed earlier about the riding moment increasing as the speed goes up, you know, the centre of buoyancy moves to a point about, you know, 1.8 metres perhaps outside the chine. So to make the point, you know, the half beam of the boat's 2.4, let's say it's a minimum of 1.6, it moves outboard. Then you've got four metres of, of uh, riding arm to the centre line, plus a cannon keel. And um, to make the point that the equivalent number on a TP-52 is about gee, probably a bit under two metres. So probably about actually two metres in fact, without a canicule. Sure. So we're lighter, the canicule makes up for that, but the increased lever arm. So you end up with 180, 200% of the riding moment of a TP in certain situations. Now for the dragons in Khan. All right, so today is the final day of the Dragon Grand Prix in Khan. And uh, we already sailed for three days. It's the last day today. And hopefully we would have two races, maybe one race, depending on the wind. It still hasn't been decided yet. It's still all for taking for many crews, maybe five, six boats still can win.
we are now the first Corinthian, but overall we are 11th and we are very satisfied with this uh, results because uh, there were very many people who can sail very, very good. <laughs> and um, we are satisfied about our results. Long Beach, California is the venue for the Congressional Cup. When 10 of the top match racers in the world converge on Long Beach, California, it can only mean one thing. It's time for the annual Congressional Cup. The first two days began with a double round robin where each skipper raced against the others twice. Day one belonged to Sweden's Johnny Bernson, a former Congressional Cup winner who went through the day undefeated. His closest finish was a win against Long Beach Yacht Club's Scotty Dixon. The youngest entry, Nick Egnot Johnson from New Zealand, surprised everyone in his first Congressional Cup appearance by ending the day on five wins and only one loss, landing him in second place overall. This included a win over six-time world champion Ian Williams from Great Britain. Long Island sailor Chris Poole qualified for his first Congressional Cup and performed quite well in his matches until he was beaten by his own spinnaker in match five. When former world champion Taylor Canfield faced off against local star Scott Dixon, Long Beach Yacht Club couldn't lose. Both teams represented the club with Dixon sailing in his 20th Congressional Cup and Canfield representing the club's new America's Cup entry. In the end, Dixon got the better of Canfield, much to the delight of the hometown crowd on the Belmont Pier. At the end of the day, Burnson led, followed by Egnot Johnson and Dixon. Day two started with more breeze and race director Mike Van Dyke fired off races with precision. Johnny Burnson maintained his winning form to remain on top of the group with his only loss at the hands of six-time world champion, Ian Williams. Williams' only loss came from Long Beach Yacht Club's Scotty Dixon. Taylor Canfield also rose to the occasion moving into second place overall, although his only loss of the day was to the event's overall leader, Johnny Bernson. So the stage is set for the conclusion of the round robin on day number three of the Congressional Cup, with all sailors eyeing a spot in the semifinals later this week. Big winds and choppy seas at the Trofeo Princess Sophia. And look at the committee boat, it's on the rocks. Yeah, it was pretty pretty extreme conditions. Um, I guess probably more the sea state than, than the breeze. We got up to about 20 knots, a um, couple of metre uh, swell. Uh, we finished, I think, seventh in the race, so not, not great. Um, we got off the line, went a bit right, and, and went pretty heavily left, and we had a lot of separation sort of at the, at the first top mark, so it was pretty much actually the race finished uh, for most of the fleet. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's been an up and down week. We're, we're pretty happy, with, I guess, with performance and trying to tick off a few other things. And, you know, we had some pretty deep scores, so we're just looking at that and, um, yeah, trying to uh, build on those little mistakes for, for the next event. Yeah, today was the final day here in Palma. Um, the metal race, unfortunately, was blown out. The waves were a bit too big and a bit breezy for us. Um, yeah, we're really happy we won, and it's the first event of the season here in Europe, and yeah, we're stoked. Lot, lots of gains still to be had, but um, overall we raced well, and yeah, happy. Today is a, a day for the real boats. You can see all the skiffs and the catarans all stuck on shore, looking silly, and um, yeah, the 470s and the fins and the lasers, we all got out there, and. Went slowly still, but we had a really good time. So uh, no, no, on a day like today, the waves and the wind make, make our boat quite a bit of fun and, and quite close racing still, which is really enjoyable. So they say only the real boats race today, but they need 30 knots and big waves to get on the plane. We go fast every day, so um, good luck to those guys. <laughs> Thank you.
Metal Rice time for the fins. And the Kiwis look good. Close going into the race today between Giles and myself. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to sort of stick close to him and see if I could slow him down at all throughout the race to sort of put us in the back and not enable him to get an opportunity to put that many boats between us. Um, I was reasonably pleased with the way I dealt with Andy attacking me at the start line. Uh, so, I, so I started up on his hip and then managed to hold him out to the port lay line. And, um, when he came at me, I tried dialing down and getting a penalty on him, which unfortunately got green, green flagged. Um, led out towards the left-hand side, but had a, and actually managed to spit him out behind me but because of the way that the waves were. I couldn't get a big enough jump on him to uh, to tackle clear. Uh, so we ended up having a bit of a coming together near the port ley line, uh, which ended up in a in a green flag. So we were coming in on the port ley line and I was just trying to slow him down a bit but um, made a little bit of a meal of it at the end of the port ley line and he managed to roll over the top of me and put himself back into the race. Bozo managed to roll over the top and lead him into the windward mark which was which was nice and sneak round, sneak round there and got into the lead and sailed away and, uh, and won the race. Really, really quite close and uh, I'm, ple I'm pleased with the way that I managed to back the, the points that Andy put on the fleet, um, especially from the early part of the week, uh, you know, we, we were quite a long way behind, so that, I mean, that's really positive. And, yeah, it's awesome, right? it's been a really good week, really consistent for myself and Josh to both be up there at the beginning of the season, it's really cool, and we're looking forward to the rest of the season. Who's going into the finals at the Congressional Cup? Getting down to the business end of the 55th annual Congressional Cup as 10 international match racing teams all have their sights set on a spot in the top four semifinals. In first overall, Sweden's Johnny Bernson continued to dominate the round robin qualifying races, only losing one match to USA's Taylor Canfield. The seven angel spinnaker is Canfield with a massive lead over uh, Bernson. Canfield also lost only one match to his arch rival, Ian Williams. Trouble with the spinnaker added insult to injury as Williams went on to take the race. Still no kite up on Taylor's boat. After losing two matches on day one and one match on day two, Williams ended this third day of racing undefeated, showing a solid trajectory of improvement throughout the week to now sit in second overall, tied with Canfield. The regatta's youngest competitor, Nick Egnott Johnson from New Zealand, still posted an impressive performance to remain among the top four in his first ever Congressional Cup. Egnott Johnson showed why he still deserves to be among the top teams in his come-from-behind race against USA's Chris Poole. And who's going to get the better jibe? It's Egnott Johnson who pulls it off better. He's still forward. He's going to get inside at the finish boat and take the race. What a fantastic defense. Egnott Johnson wins another race. Finally, Long Beach Yacht Club's own Scotty Dixon joins Egnott Johnson and Poole, all who have a shot at the top four semifinals. And with only two round robin flights left to sail, the pressure is on.
winning obviously is the icing on the cake, but just taking part in it is fantastic. Everyone has a great time. All of us want to come back next year. March 29 World on Water had 36,000 views. Thank you very much for watching. Be sure to watch next week for another exciting adventure. The last seven days in the world of sailing.